and welcome along to week two of the championship. Cullum Cooper and Enda McGinley are with me to analyse all the action. And we're going to start with a mouth-watering Ulster quarterfinal in Oma as Tyrone and Monaghan came face to face once more. A rivalry that rarely disappoints and a provincial championship that rarely disappoints either. The Ulster Championship is the one constant championship that's very hard to predict at the start of the year. No matter what way it's balanced, it's a brilliant championship. Donegal, Ulster champions for the second year in a row. And surely now it has to be Cameron's title. Jerome, Ulster champions, 2021. Derry are the Ulster champions for the first time since 1998. Their first meeting was back in 1918. Their last was the 2021 Ulster final. 21 championship games with Monaghan leading the role of honour with 12 victories to Tyrone's nine. That's the history. Now we deal with the present and perhaps the future. The first strike at goal looks to be a great one. And the white flag will be raised off the boot, boot of Darren McCurry. Dazzler! opens the score. Great score if he gets any bit of space at all. He'd always kick those and he's so accurate. Jack McCarran sends it in. Good position is Rhino too. Getting inside the cover. Three Tyrone defenders. Chase back. Backtrack. Ryan Wiley. Bally Bay. He's going to have a goal. It's his opening match in his inter-county career at championship level and look what you have here. He's from Scottstown and they certainly know their football in that part of the country. Outstanding score, Marty. Earlier in the move, he made a brilliant sidestep as well to kind of keep developing the passage of play and a great finish. Darren Canada. Nice ball inside. Tyrone looking very sharp. There's a goal on here. Brilliant. Excellent football up front from Tyrone. And since four o'clock, they look eager, determined, prepared. And well able to take a score. Yeah, they turned, over the, they turned over the kick out, and when they got in here, then that was a great finish. Anna Muller taking on another Michael, Michael McKernan. Connor McManus hits it straight, hits it straight between the posts and over the bar. You just cannot beat class. Yeah, that's brilliant, Marty. Kicking from that side for a right footer, it's such a small envelope that he's put it into. Fantastic score. Tyrone have put the pressure on. They've availed of the opportunity here to take a quick free. It's that man, Derek Hanneman, again. He hits it, and the white flag will be raised. For the third time for Derek Hanneman. He's now scored a goal and three points, and we've only 17 minutes gone. That's excellent. And crucially, Marty, I think both sides are keeping forwards up. Like I said, great to watch. Boy, perhaps I'm not too sure he meant that for Derek Canavan, but Canavan took it on his toes, made a bit of space, no. and scores his fourth point of the game. MC definitely didn't mean it, Marty, but Derek Canavan's hands, he was just, he, he retained possession, didn't spill it, he's so sharp today. Nine Morgan breaking it away from Carl Gallagher. Nine Morgan then holding on to the jersey. Advantage being given from the referee. Connor Boy goes forward. Nine Morgan is backtracking, as you can see in the yellow jersey, making his way back to the goalpost. Connor McManus skips away from two challenges and a third. Still McManus in towards the D. He hits it and is just outside. He yeah, has a free anyway, I'd say, Marty. That's the angle. Well within his range. Never in any doubt. Over towards Matty Donnelly. Sees the running being provided by Brian Kennedy. Back again, Michael Kernan, Matty Donnelly, shooting from distance, but shooting accurately as well. That's a goal and 72 points he scored in 59 championship appearances. Two of them this afternoon in Oma, and they're still as good as the very first one he scored when he made his debut. Rory Beggin, he's outside the Tyrone 45. That's a very good ball. To his pullback, Kieran Duffy steps inside and puts it over the black spot. Goalkeeper and fullback show the forwards how it's done. 
This is better for Monet. Trying to get inside nicely, dummy. Still Stephen O'Han and brought down in front of the square. Inside the square, it's a free for Monet. That's right, put in the post. Jack McCarran, they're trying to engineer a goal. Goes to the right, goes to the left. Nine more than saves it. And there is suddenly an adrenaline rush around Healy Tar. And there is a boss amongst the crowd and indeed amongst all of us here. Good goalkeeper, his primary job is now Morgan had to come out. Dummy to the left, dummy to the right, and Morgan did well. Carlo Collin. Michael Bannigan makes the stakes. Oh, this will be a superb point. Oh, fantastic. Michal Bannigan. Brilliant score, Matt Marty. He was very peripheral in the first half, and we were expecting more from him. Darren McCurry, All Ireland minor medalist 2010. Great crossfield pass. Can he turn? Can he watch? Tom Kilpatrick puts it over the bar. What a pass from Darren McCurry. Rory Beggin. It's a good ball. Into us, Carl Gallagher. Shimmy to the left. He's inside the cover. Can he shoot? He can! Brilliant, brilliant score. Great ball inside. To the inside line, it was a sweet ball. Yeah, a sweet ball inside, Marty. Sure, we're always making the point about those kind of diagonal kickballs inside. It was Rory Began that put it in. Carl Gallagher won it. Steve Mohanan, we've commented on his sidestep and that ability he has to get around players since the start of the game. What a finish. What a game we have in our hands. Thoroughly enjoyable. Monaghan shooting from way out the field. Oh, my word. Is unbelievable shooting and confident play by Monad and a great score indeed by Shane Carey. Yeah, another excellent player. He's very good in the ball, accurate shooter left and right. Great score. Looking for the run, provided by Darren McCurry. McCurry needs a little bit of help. Comes in the shape of Connor Myler. Inside, there's a chance of a goal, and Rory Beggins saves as Ronan McNamee joins. The Tyrone attack. On the 45 meter line, it's Nile Morgan. 167 competitive appearances, 44 in the championship. He scored 39 points going into this game. And that is over the bar. Away goes Conor McCarthy. Is there a winner coming from Monaghan? Carlo Carlo managed somehow to get it first. Conor McCarthy! And he puts it over the bar. Is he the match winner? Wonderful move between McCarthy and Carlo Connell on the 70th minute. Six minutes to go. The response is coming from Tyrone. Rapidly. Very rapidly. Now it's Sludden. What a performance. Good sign of Sludden to get back up the pitch and uh, kick the equalising score. Oh, Medina. This is good play by Tyrone. Jersey pulling. Jersey pulling. The referee still doesn't give a free. The ball is loose and available. It's popped outside. There's a chance. And that is sent between the posts and over the bar. Kennedy, Derek Anavan, McCurry, key players for Tyrone. Kennedy poked it away. Watch the hands here from Derek Anavan, Marty. Unbelievable. As he was falling, slipped the pass. McCurry's never going to miss those. Monaghan have to draw level for the sixth time. But can they create it? Carlo Cole. Nice ball, it comes to the debutant, Brian O'Toole! Oh, my word! Incredible! There is a different storyline. There is a different ending that we wouldn't expect it. The old stagers, Carl O'Connor to Kieran Duffy, and he slipped in one of the rookies making his first stop. Quite a finish from Ryan O'Toole. Did what you're supposed to do, according to all the coaches. Put it on the deck, drill it low and hard. Here we go. It's floated in. Can there be a touch? It's on the line and it's stopped. And Monaghan kicked the ball away. Fittingly by Connor McManus. Monaghan have travelled to Healy Park, Oma, to give Vinnie Corey in his first championship season a first championship victory. The full time score is Monaghan, two goals at 17 points. Tyrone, one goal, 18, in a breathless encounter in Oma.
we knew there was an awful lot left in the tank. Uh, Throne were only five points up, um, so we had a slight breeze in our backs. The game was still there. There was no real panic stations, you know. We, we knew we had to go at them a wee bit more. Um, we knew we had to get a, a handling around the middle of the field. I thought they maybe won maybe the first share of the long kickouts in the first half and pinned us. We pinned in, them in and we did it to them in the second half. And we got a good platform around there and the boys drove with pace. And uh, listen, we got the goals. We got the goals was the big thing. No, it was very tough now, coming into the final stretch. Jeez, we just knew we had dug deep. We said at half time, look at if we're in for a few points coming into the final stretch. We have, look at we have the experience coming in with Conor McManus and we brought Kieran Hughes and look at you have Carlo Connell and them boys. Look at there are a few of us younger boys. They're going to take us with us. They're going to take us with them to the final whistle and look at we just stuck with it. Well, the first half we were on top and probably didn't translate that enough onto the scoreboard. Um, we had a lot more opportunities. We didn't take some of them. Some of them we should have been taking. Uh, probably gave up a few, too many frees in the first half. We conceded too much and it kept Monaghan in the game. Uh, in the second half it was just a rule reversal. Nearly we were chasing the game. We invited Monaghan on to us too much. Um, they had their purple patch and it just kept going on and going on and we could never arrest it properly. Yeah, thriller between uh, Monaghan and Tyrone. We're well used to them. It was another one that really delivered today, Colm. Yeah, thoroughly enjoyable game. Um, I suppose we've been used to tight, tense affairs, especially in the early rounds of the Ulster Championship. Not like that today. Both teams had a real go. Uh, it was a game of two halves, really. Um, I suppose you, we saw the scenes at the end, what it meant to the Monaghan players. People talk about devaluing um, provincial championships, but it meant a lot to those boys today. So I think Tyrone look will be disappointed. They came out of the traps, were very, very strong. Um, but it just goes to show, Monaghan, if you hang around long enough in a game um, and your big players stand up when, when the chips are down, and they did that today, that's a fabulous win for them. And they, they'll feel they, they can take a few more scalps in the championship, I'm sure. Um, for Tyrone, it's rebuild. It's five weeks off. It'll be interesting to see what they do. Do they go back to their clubs? Do they just put their head down and do a bit of training? Their season's not gone yet. But, um, look, today it was certainly about Monaghan and their never-say-die attitude because five points down at half-time, they could easily have rolled over in Oma. Um, fabulous win, and Vinnie Corey and the players deserve a huge amount of credit. Yeah, for sure. What about Tyrone then, I guess, and when you look at the mentality of both sides? As Colm said, look, it's a very long road still uh, for this season, but their mentality, their belief, where are they after this? Look, they'll be disappointed. They'll be licking their wounds tonight, particularly that second-half performance was poor. There was a lot of... Uh, mistakes made, uh, a lot of really bad turnovers, poor shots were open defensively in the second half. I thought in the first half actually we were looking really, really good, but as Colm says, it was a game of two halves. But they'll know there's, there was enough crumbs of comfort in that match. At times I thought it was the best football they've played this year, but they definitely slipped off in the second half. In terms of the impact it has for them long term, for me it's, it's how much of an impact they want to have it to make. I think all teams will go through and even all of the top teams have already taken setbacks in the National League and potentially big losses. But that's going to be the nature of this season. There's many more games, there's going to be more losses, more twists and turns. For Throne, they'll still believe in that dressing room that they can win the Ireland. It's up to them to use the next mm -hmm. five weeks as productively as possible. They're, they could well go back to the club. There'd yeah. nearly be that attitude sometimes in Throne that would like the odd club game. Uh, but five weeks, plenty of time that, that, that they can turn it around. Yeah, but look, the one thing that we do know after today, we, I mean, we said it before, the Ulster Championship, of all the provincial championships, it's the one that just gives us these moments time and time again. Yeah, it just keeps on giving, and it's impossible to predict, you know, Tyrone, Oma, Tyrone coming back after finding their mojo halfway through the league. We thought they'd be difficult to turn over, but Monaghan, our decide, we thought they were going to be relegated halfway through the league. They turned that around, <laughs> they survived again. And um, they have just a huge belief in, 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 in that Ulster Championship. They keep fighting and fighting, and they have a lot of quality as well. And when you have McManus, you always have a chance. Yeah. In, in a way, the game nearly reflected both teams' National League campaigns. Like Tyrone, there was mm. spots of real quality and spots of poor. Monaghan, there was that never-say-day attitude yeah. and that remarkable mm. ability to escape from tight corners. Both of them things were, were showing up today. The fact that it was so open, was that because it wasn't do or day? You know, Ulster football obviously is fairly... It, 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 was, a, it, was, a the it was a definite factor. Like I met Petey Hart, yes, uh, on Saturday up at Gravahe and I was saying, how's the game or how are they approaching it with the Ulster Championship and the, and the elongated season? And he says, well, look, it's still Monaghan. It's a big game. You want to go and win. But it was as much, look, let's go and have a cut. Uh, it's Monaghan. You don't want to lose to Monaghan, but it wasn't the end of the world. You could sense it wasn't the end of the world. So, and again, there was enough positives there from a throne point of view, probably more so from a Monaghan point mm -hmm. of view. But they have day to take on. That's going to be an, a huge game for them. 
uh, Trone can go and regroup and, and plan for the group stage. Yeah, well, look, it'll be fascinating to watch that. Uh, and we've got plenty more to pick over on that, but time for us to take a quick break here on the programme. We've got plenty more to come, though. We're going to dig a little deeper to analyse that thriller and the spills in Oma. A Derry domination at Brewster Park as the defending Ulster champions begin their 2023 campaign. And we've got the best of the rest from the Joe McDonough Cup and the Camogie League finals in Croke Park. Fantastic scenes in Oma as Monaghan snatch a late victory courtesy of this championship debutant. Marty caught up with the man of the moment, Ryan O'Toole. Well, back here in Healy Park in Oma, there's only one name that's being talked about. Not alone in Tyrone, but particularly in Monaghan. That's Ryan O'Toole, who scored that amazing winning goal in, the, in extra time. Ryan, uh, first of all, congratulations. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Will, will you talk to me about your championship debut? Because today was a big day for you before you ever scored the winning goal. Yeah, here, you know, going in, you know, the task was to mark two of the best forwards in the country, I suppose. Uh, so a wee bit excited, a wee bit nervous, you know, to test myself. But here, just I, I couldn't believe, you know, that I was finally, finally getting to make my debut, and just wanted to take it with two hands, I suppose. Well, you had a great start as well, hadn't you? Ah, uh, no, McCurry got the first score off me, and I suppose I got the next one. But uh, yeah, it kind of settled me into the game a wee bit. You know, it kind of, kind of calmed the nerves and say, here, I'm here in Championship football. I'm glad to be here. When you went into the dressing rooms here behind me at halftime, you were five points down. What was, what was said by Vinny? What was said <laughs> by the team? What was the attitude? It was just, it was echoed kind of, this is the same old story of us playing Tyrone. We know we didn't impose ourselves in the game. We let them dominate us. We let them control the tempo. And we said, can't do that again. Every time we've done it, we've lost. And it's been a huge part of why we've lost some of those close games. And we said, we need to do it fast, coming out of the second half and not leave it too late. And thankfully, that's kind of what we did. And we got, drew, drew them back in. I mean, you did great. It was a game of two halves and indeed uh, uh, even second halves after that as well. It was really divided. But your, your score was truly fantastic. Talk to me because we can look at it here. Uh, talk to me about what your thoughts were when the ball was delivered out to you. Uh, I was wondering, was I gonna, was some man gonna come up behind me and bust me here? But uh, <laughs> you know, great, great pass by Kate off, great runs coming in to draw defenders away, and I just saw myself one on one. Said, I'm gonna go for this here. You know, it might not be the right option, but I said, I'm just gonna ha have a go. Like most people in that position, and your manager, I'm sure, would be saying, put it <laughs> over the bar. Yeah, uh, with with you know. With me being a defender, I suppose to definitely say that, but to hear it, I back myself and said, I'm going to just enjoy it, and, uh, and I really enjoyed that, yeah. And what was it like, that moment of elation and uh, joy, and was, to hear the crowd? It was absolutely electric, but then by the time you passed halfway, they had the ball, they had the ball up the field, and there was no time to celebrate anymore. You know, I had to switch on and kind of get back, what's the next job I can do here? Well, I presume, Ryan, you'll never, ever forget your first senior championship match for uh, Monaghan. No, I don't think I will, and I'm glad I won't. I'm sure you won't. We, we won't forget it either. But uh, from Ryan and myself, uh, from a joyous Monaghan camp here in Oma, it's back to you. Uh, like, that's what you want to see, Colm, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's so refreshing. Like, he, on your debut, to get the winning goal, and you can see the joy, and he's, bu he's absolutely buzzing after it. So, uh, we were, when we were watching, we were saying, over the bar, over the bar. Well, I was. Inda wasn't, <laughs> to be fair. Um, but fortune favours the brave, and um, it's certainly a day he'll never forget. I saw Darren O'Sullivan on Twitter saying 99.9% .9 of players fist that over the bar. It's amazing. Yeah, I reckon there's managers up and down the country who are going to be tearing their hair out because for the rest of this season, whenever some fella, every fella will back himself and try and go for the goal now from these tight angles and managers will be going, you know, Ryan O'Toole, there's a hashtag on Twitter to ban the fist pass. Yeah. Well, they've now got the poster boy in Ryan O'Toole and certainly from a drone point of view, if somebody is expecting to be taken out of it in Healy Park, it'll be a good job to take him yeah. out of it if he's going to score a goal like that. I think... Even maybe Niall Morgan, you'd argue, was he expecting him to go for the goal? Mm. Uh, you know, he'll be disappointed. The shot went through his legs. Obviously, he'll be disappointed with that. But nobody was... I certainly wasn't expecting him to, to, to go for it. But there you go. That oh, was a touch of class, that's for sure. Look, speaking of a touch of class, we've got to start off with Derek Canavan and his performance today, Colin. one five for him, and some of the stuff he did today was magic. Yeah, he was a real shining light for Tyrone. Look, he's, he's emerging as one of the top forwards in the country. We knew the talent was there. We certainly knew the pedigree was there. But... Glimpse is a brilliance today. He was he was powerful. He was stretching teams. He was very elusive. This is a fa fabulous finish. How many players just blast this at the goalie? He takes his time. He knows exactly what he wants to. And this is my favourite score. The hands, the turn, unbelievable. 
He's low centre of gravity and he's gone away. He's two yards in his defender. And again, when they were struggling to get scores in the second half, he was the guy stepping up and he was trying to find a way to, to get Tyrone back into the game because things weren't flowing so easy. He's a big player and they'll need him and many more to get to rehabilitate themselves in this championship, but he's um, he's turning into the player we thought he was going to be. Yeah, he's we're, a chip we're... off the old block, isn't he? Mm. <laughs> he is high, and, and, and the Muller would have claims too. There's a strong Gardy <laughs> side on the Carrick Moore side, but uh, like Throne got 114 from play yeah. today. They had to work hard, I would have thought, for some of the frees that maybe they could have got in the second half, but like 114 from play is a sign that that aspect of the game is going well. It's probably the defensively in, in the second half particularly we, we fell down, but you were asking at the top of the show about where, where do Trone go from here, how will they feel to hit 114 from play in, a, in an Ulster Championship match. Uh, it was special, but certainly Dara's performance was, was standard. Yeah, for sure. What about Monaghan then, Colin? When you look at this revival, particularly in the second half, five points down at half time, completely different story in the second half. Yeah, and uh, even in the first half, they looked a couple of yards off the pace, Jackie, to be honest. They were, they, they, Tyrone set the tone, but Rory Began, we've seen this goalkeeper's coming up the field, beautiful pass into Duffy over the bar. And that was the first score of the second half. And it just, I felt there was a bit of a bounce and a pep in them again. And this is a gorgeous score from Michal Bannigan out on the right, curls it over beautifully, and you could see this was giving them energy. And while this was going on, Tyrone were missing down the other side, and every time Monaghan came down, there was a huge confidence that they could get the scores. Conor McCarthy, who played a massive part in the second half of the game, and this is just a work rate that wasn't there in the first half. Disciplined, get three, four, five bodies around, and turn over, turn over Tyrone, and they were down the field. That's what, what we just didn't see. That's what we were looking to see from Monaghan in the first half, but it just wasn't there. Again, Dara Canavan going through in the second half, Five, five Monaghan players, they were working hard, they were disciplined, turn them over and down the field they went. And that was the, the spirit that they found. I suppose from a Throne point of view, I think you, you named it there, energy. Monaghan was gaining energy, I think Tyrone gave them quite a bit of energy. They came out, they almost seemed slower at it in the second half and then some of the turnovers, we've seen that hand pass there from Kieran McGeary here, Michael McCairn, and again a key player. Just a really loose kick pass and that types of thing. Throne were trying to sort of control the game and slow the game down. And that's fine, but you can't then give away easy shots. Here, Frank Burns tries a shot, and actually two of those turnovers went up and got scores at the other end, and it's that type of thing. Yes, absolutely, Monaghan. They were more aggressive in kickouts. Mm -hmm. Some of Vinnie Corey's changes worked a treat. Some of the players who were quiet in the first half, the likes of Conor McCarthy, came right back in it, had a huge game. Carlo O'Connell mm -hmm. right back in it. So Monaghan as a whole lifted. The Vinnie Corey's changes added to that, they pushed up in the throne kickouts, that helped as well. But Throne definitely, for me, were authors of their own downfall, they just came out, their energy was falling a wee bit in that second half and they paid the price. Yeah, for sure. Well, look, what about the end of it then? I mean, the frantic finish, you guys were on your feet watching the end of this end. Yeah, it was just score for score up and down the pitch. Uh, the game was very open at that stage, it sort of all bets were off and this is obviously the key score. The player marked is Mr. Ryan O'Toole, who done the <laughs> brilliant interview a few minutes ago. He started in the 21-yard line, the very deepest Monaghan player. Thrown for me, very, very central. They'll be disappointed that he just was left completely open as he ghosted in. Nell Sludden goes here, fails to make any contact, and here, where the fist that over the bar was on, he missed it, and then it just led to sort of a thrown through everything at it here at the end, but that's... They had, had, they had allowed Monon back into it, Monon had got the noses in and this was what they were left trying to salvage something from the game at the end, just lobbing ball in. Yeah, again, it was just a bit of mayhem in the last couple of seconds. Roy Biggin coming out, getting a hand, I think there's a free here for Tyrone. Um, it's Conor Moyler and they just lob it in and damage was done, as I say, it's huge. And you can just see at the end of the game what it means to McManus and the rest of his teammates. Also semi-finals to look forward to. Um, probably written off going into this game a little bit. But a um, huge, huge win, and it's, it's, it's going to spice up that semi final with Derry very, very nicely. Yeah, for sure. Look, you mentioned Conor McManus. You look at him at the end there. You know, you just think about the records today. That was his 60th consecutive championship appearance going back to 2007. It's some record, isn't it? It's incredible. It's incredible. Like, I think he actually started his career at wing back as well. But he's one of the finest kickers we've seen, and certainly in my time watching Gaelic football. But he's more than that, he's a leader for his team. Uh, every time you need him to stand up, he does, and he can kick a point from anywhere, Jackie. So I'm delighted for him, and we don't know how long more we'll see him in the Monaghan jersey, but um, it's great that he's going to be around for, for, for a few more games this season, and he could take a few more scalps. Yeah, for sure. Well, look, uh, plenty more for us to chat on on Ulster football again a little bit later on. But Croke Park hosted the Camogie League finals today as Kerry and Meath met in the Division 2A decider, while Cork and Galway renewed their light rivalries in repeat of last year's Division 1A final.
In perfect conditions at Crow Park, Cork got off to a dream start with the goal inside the opening four minutes. Orla Cahalan took possession and drove at the Galway defence before her shot eventually found its way past Fiona Ryan. Galway responded with a pair of points from Carrie Dolan, but Cork established a 1-2 to two points lead by the 11th minute thanks to this score from Saoirse McCarthy. Six minutes later, the defending champions moved in front. Niamh McPeak's initial effort was well saved, but Carrie Dolan was there to follow up and send Galway 1-4 to 1-3 ahead. Cork responded well and hit the last four points of the half, including this score from Laura Hayes, to take a 1-8 to 1-6 lead at half-time. Trailing by a point midway through the second half, Galway struck for a crucial second goal through Sabina Rabbit to retake the lead, moving 2-9 to 1-10 in front. This helped Cahill Murray's side take control, with a point from Dolan soon followed by an effort from midfielder Aoife Donoghue. Cork captain Amy O'Connor found the range to close the gap to two before the impressive Dolan fired over from a free to help Galway into a 2-12 to 1-12 advantage. With time running out, Cork went in search of a goal and almost got it five minutes from time, with Amy O'Connor and Sorkin McCartan combining, but the Galway defence stood firm and cleared the danger. Leading by three into added time, the result was secured by this outstanding effort from Onya Keane to push Galway four points ahead. It finished Galway 2-13, Cork 1-12. You know, this is our fourth final in a row after losing. You know, it's, it's, it's like, uh, the girls are consistent. We're getting there. We're getting to the finals. Like, but just these losses are they're tough going. Like, you know, this, this is probably the hardest one now because I, I thought we were in good shape. Like, but we just got our eyes open there again. Fair play to Galway. The experience came through in the end. When we, we look back at the, you know, the, the first round game against Tipperary and where we came from, Look, it's a really, really good league to win for us. But look, we did the same last year, and it didn't make it. You know, it makes no difference in the championship. And um, you know, at the end of the day, we're going to be, you know, judged on what we do in the championship. But um, look, for a young team, it's a new squad, and it's it's really, really good to have a national title. It took some nine minutes for Kerry to get off the mark in the Division 2A final with this excellent score from Eva Behan, leaving the sides level at a point apiece. The impressive Aoife Minogue opened Mead's account with a 45 and then converted an outstanding point from play to leave matters at two points each as the game approached the midway point of the first half. The next three scores went the way of Mead, but Kerry responded through Amy O'Sullivan, with Mead taking a seven points to six advantage in at the break. Kerry hit over the opening two points of the second half, but Mead hit back with two quickfire scores from Amy Gaffney, leaving the Royals nine points to eight in front. Kerry introduced Narek Casey off the bench and she fired over a superb point in the 47th minute to push her side 11-10 in front. Kerry's advantage was extended to two as the game entered into the closing stages with Patrice Diggin on target to open up a 13 points to 11 lead. A goal would have been a potentially decisive score for either side and Meath almost found the net in the final minute of normal time. Minogue's initial shot was saved before the follow-up from Abby Donnelly went wide of the post. Donnelly did hit a point soon after to close the gap to one, but Jackie Horgan made sure of the result for Kerry as they won by 14 points to Meath's 13 points to secure a first Division 2A title. Yeah, and congratulations to Kerry and to Galway. We're going to take another quick break here on the programme. But we'll be back shortly with a roundup from the Joe McDonough Cup and we'll have reaction and analysis of Derry's clash with Fermanagh in Brewster Park. Welcome back. We'll get to Fermanagh Derry shortly, but first, round two of the Joe McDonough Cup saw Leash rack up a big win against Down. Offaly made it two from two with victory in Kildare, and there was a top of the table clash between Kerry and Carlo. Cahal Milani rounds up the action on that one in Tralee. Coming into the match off the back of a big win over Kildare, Carlo enjoyed a bright start with Chris Nolan giving his side a two point lead inside the opening minute. Kerry gradually got to grips with the visitors and were level by the fourth minute when Shane Conway followed a free with this score from play. Playing with a real urgency, Carlo responded instantly with this point from James Doyle, pushing them in front once again. 
Kerry trailed by seven points to five midway through the first half when Michael Lean took on possession and hit one of the game's best scores to close the gap to the minimum. Soon after, Carlo had an opportunity to register the game's first goal, but Paddy Boland and Chris Nolan were both denied by brilliant defending from Kerry, with the home team eventually clearing their lines after winning a free. Carlo led by 11 points to seven at half-time and moved five in front in the early stages of the second half, thanks to James Doyle. Kerry then started to really come into the game, scoring the next five points in a row, including this lovely effort from Shane Conway. The game was level after 68 minutes when cornerback Paddy O'Connor got in on the scoring act to leave it at 20 points apiece and set up a tense finish. With Martin Kavanagh solid from freeze all throughout, it looked as though Carlo had done enough to get over the line when Fia Griffiths Patrick fired over as the game entered added time. But Kerry managed to engineer one final opportunity with time almost up as Michael Lean found the target to ensure it ended all square. It finished Kerry 21 points, Carlo 21 points. Yeah, so Kerry doing well in the Joe McDonough. Won the camogie as well today. Ladies football last weekend. You're going well. They're putting pressure on the footballers, for the, <laughs> for the men footballers for the championship. But a lot, lot of good work being done by the camogie and the, the men hurlers. Particularly happy for the, the lady footballers too. I've been playing so. Um, they lost the All Ireland last year in the final, so they'll be very pleased to get back to Crow Park and, and, and take a trophy. So um, onwards and upwards. Yeah, look, we won't split Kerry in two just yet. <laughs> uh, we'll look back to Ulster football then, and Inniskillen hosted the other football uh, quarter final this weekend as Derry began the defence of their provincial crown against Fermanagh. Here's the best of the action from Darren Maloney. First championship meeting between these two in 12 years at Brewster Park. The pitch should be OK. It's a new surface, but the rain last month has affected the bedding in period. Darren McGurn started the match in the middle of the field or was out for the throw in anyway. Coming out from full forward, Connor Glass is fit. Owen McAvoy, a late addition to the Derry team making his championship debut. We'll see where he lines up Had a very good year playing as a defender. That's Connor McCluskey of Derry. There's a, a bit of a wind there, and it is with Fermanagh in the first half. Here's Brendan Rogers, that formidable midfield pairing with Connor Glass, and they're in already, and they get the first score of the game, and it is Owen McAvoy. He scored a couple of points in the league, did Owen McAvoy, but that's some start to his championship career inside the first minute. Chrissy McCaig. They didn't risk him in the league final. Wanted him ready for today. Ethan Doherty. Luke Flanagan is in front of him, the Fermanagh cornerback. And he's still going with him. Doherty held it up well. Here's Connor McCluskey. He's turned into an attacking weapon already. And that's Paul Cassidy. And Derry can do no wrong. They're playing some fantastic football. And they're making this Fermanagh team look very ordinary. Four points to no score. We've only been playing for six minutes. Brilliant, brilliant start for Derry. Shane McGullion, it's his championship debut for Fermanagh. Alton Kelm, they want him to run at Derry. And this is what he's been doing all year. Gets to the end line. And Lee Cullen trying to get on the end of that. Niall Toner is there for Derry. And Fermanagh have the ball still. Jonathan Cassidy, the home crowd getting more involved. That's Ryan Jones, and that is absolutely stunning from Ryan Jones. What a score from the midfielder, and that is some way to open Fermanagh's account. Kieran Donnelly will want more and more of that from Ryan Jones. Fermanagh had a player receiving treatment there, but he's uh, rejoined their defensive setup now. Connor McCluskey of Derry, Ethan Doherty. Oh, that's a good ball and a really good bit of defending from Shay Cullen, but Shay McGregor has got a goal! Shane McGregor's goal in the 13th minute. What a score that is, because it looked as if Shay Cullen had actually dealt with this. Somehow, Shane McGregor got this off the fullback. What a finish, too. He's in quite close to Sean McNally, and McNally would have seen this, but too late. And that is what Shane McGuigan can do, and it's a big moment in this Ulster quarter-final. Orrin Lynch 
doesn't mind this at all. Oh, what about that pass from Oren Lynch for Paul Cassidy? And off goes Cassidy, and he's still going. Still for Derry goal for Paul Cassidy. Well, his persistence paid off. A second goal, and that feels huge for Derry, and it feels pretty grim for Fermanagh. We'll go all the way back to the Oren Lynch pass, which was beautiful. And so was that finish from Paul Cassidy. Well, Fermanagh need to up the pace here. Derry will just coast to half-time. Here's Oren Lynch. Ethan Doherty. They look threatening again. They look really threatening. Shane McGuigan again. He's going for another goal. He's got a point. But the power in that from Shane McGuigan. And we could have turned the lights out right there if that had gone in from Shane McGuigan. A rasper, they used to call them. Maybe they still do. 2-8 to 5. Shea Cullen, Ryan Jones. Now, how quickly can they move the ball forward? Well, he's taken a lot out of it, Ryan Jones. That allows the Derry defenders to get back in position. Alton Kelm decides to have a go. And it's just kissed the upright. And it's gone between the posts. That's a lovely score. His second, Alton Kell. They need much more like this. Ryan Jones. Now, this could be promising for them. Tight marking from McKinless. Connor McShay. They're just being repelled back out the field. Kean McManus. There was a hand in on that. And you never know as the ball is played in. Shea Cullen for Fermanagh. Goal! Well, that's what they needed. Shea Cullen. Back from travelling. Well, he'd gone in at full forward. The deflection changes everything, and so did that touch from Conor McCluskey. And Shea Cullen, well, they need more than one goal. But that will give them hope. And listen to the crowd, who are very subdued over the last five minutes. Now Derry down at the other end. Benny Heron goes down. Penalty. A penalty is the decision. While you were watching the replay, Derry came forward very quickly. Benny Heron fouled. Declan McCusker was the player who got the touch. The surface is greasy now. So Shane McGuigan against Sean McNally. And this really would seal it now to wipe out the Fermanagh goal within a minute. McGuigan and McNally sent him the wrong way. That's a beautiful penalty. They're always beautiful when they're scored, but he sent McNally the wrong way. Cassidy again from Enniskillen. Local man. Connor McShea. Held up by Ethan Doherty. Everybody in that Derry team knows their role. Declan McCusker, a hit and hope really from him. Where will it go? Ronan McCaffrey has it. Shea Cullen, there's a gap there. Cullen is through again. Another goal. We'll leave him up at full forward now. Shea Cullen. This is remarkable stuff, and there certainly is something in this for Fermanagh. Put the ball in high. Derry can't cope with it. The ball hopping all over the place, and Shea Cullen. Well, nobody was going to stop him here. Look at the power, and what a finish. Ethan Doherty, more pace again. He just goes past Ryan Lyons as if he wasn't even there. Outstanding block down by Josh Largo Ellis. And as the rain starts to fall again, that is Niall Lachlan. No let up from Derry. Benny Heron. We expect to see that turn in from left to right, but it didn't. And that's Connor Doherty. Back to Connor McCluskey. And it's tapped over by Niall Toner of Derry. Well, Fermanagh's spirit is broken now at this stage. And well, for them, it's just damage limitation. And Derry running up a big total. Oren Lynch. He scored one point from play during the first half. He's had some brilliant passes too. And the problem for Fermanagh is nobody knows who to go to him. And that time, he'll put that in for an assist. 
Oren Lynch. Paul Cassidy gets the score. So Oren Lynch has done everything in this match. Conor McCluskey. Paul Cassidy. Gareth McKinless taking the ball forward to Shane McGuigan. And that's another lovely score from Shane McGuigan. Derry have put on a bit of a show at times during the second half. Sure, they conceded the two goals, but they have been by far the better team. So we are in the dying seconds of this Ulster quarterfinal. Fermanagh gave Derry a couple of frights in the second half in the shape of those two Shea Cullen goals, but the Shane McGuigan penalty settled them down, and from there they just cruised to the winning line, and they're about to cross that now. But this is a victory today, a thoroughly deserved victory, and an impressive scoreline of Derry, 317 to Fermanagh's two goals at eight. Yeah, impressive, all right, and a lot for Rory Gallagher to be pleased about when you look at it, 11 different scorers and a lot of cohesion in his team in general. Yeah, absolutely. The, the hallmark that we've sort of become uh, known for this in this day team, how well they work together, was, was here right from the start yesterday. Within five minutes, this match was almost over. Brent Rogers came through. Again, it looks a simple pass, but the shot was on for him. Instead, he passed it to McAvoy, who, who slotted it over. Here again, keeping the width for Mana generally, we're, we're almost man to man, spreading it over, leaving it completely open for Owen Lynch. But the rest of the Derry players stayed away, and it's that knowledge of each other. Uh, here again, playing the ball in McGuigan, he was well on form yesterday. Again, that lovely sort of backdoor cut that, that, that we'll look about. Simple scores, the amount of dairy scores that just came from that central area. And then their game awareness too. Fermanagh got the goal, they were all pushed up, and straight afterwards, Orrin Lynch launched the long kick out to Benny Heron, or it ended up with Benny Heron, who got the wee push in the back and, and the penalty, and that was them right back into the game. We know they love switching about, the members of the full forward line. To emphasise that, Pat Padraig Cassidy, who I think, I can't remember him scoring in the National League, he's still seen it upon him, took it upon himself to go into the full forward line, present like a full forward, take the ball and put it over the bar. So in terms of a team that everybody knows the rules and there's this sort of flexibility in how they play, which makes them so hard to shut down, uh, they, they were well on it yesterday. You can question, I suppose, how much Fermanagh really asked them questions, but from a dairy point of view, they had any answers to, to, to what Fermanagh were, were asking them. What about Fermanagh then, Colm? Because you look at it, I suppose there's, there's lots of pros, there's, mm. uh, there's a lot for them to be working on as well, though, after it. You know, as Enda said, yeah. there's, there's plenty there to be picking over. And I suppose they're coming off the back of a National League campaign where they were promoted, Jackie, so mm. like, confidence would be reasonably high. But I think they were very naive yesterday in the way they, they, the way they set up. You know, they, At times they got loads of bodies back, but were, were they doing a whole pile? And I'm not too sure. You can see um, Paul McGrogan, 10 yards of space here. Taps it over, and this, these are the early stages of the match. And even as I was watching this, I was concerned for him. Eden Darty, he has three options looking in. They're all two, two yards ahead of their men. Um, McGuigan, who's a very, very good player, we know how dangerous he can be. They were finding space just way too easy for me. At times, even inside the first 15 minutes, I think they had four kickouts of their own that they lost going long. Um, again, goalkeepers looking for options, but there's a two on one. You can see. Uh, Brendan Rogers and the Derry goalkeeper Lynch are up. There's a two on one. He kicks it out to Ryan Jones. Impossible for Ryan Jones. And eventually, when they did go short, they were, they were able to get their ball, the ball inbound. But as, when they get it to midfield, they just go direct. There's nothing fancy about it. It was just, they were all over the place a little bit, I felt early on. They did rally, they did come, come back. But again, that was an opportunity there to stop the Derry player. Cassidy coming through the middle, who's a very fine player. But again, you've got to go to where the point of danger is. And, for man of defence, we're very disappointed with that, and I think when Kieran Donnelly looks back at this, he'll, he'll, he'll be he'll be he'll have a lot of questions. This time in the second half, they rallied, they showed a bit of spirit, and Shea Cullen this time again, high balls into the square caused problems for Derry, and um, they'll be really disappointed with this one, Derry. Uh, it's a great it's a great pick up, but he goes right through him. It's a very very good finish, but for for Manor, they have to look to the Talton Cup. I think it gives them a better opportunity to be playing teams against their own level. I don't think any of us expected them to beat Derry last night. But at the same time, they, they can come back. And we saw what Westmead did last year in terms of winning the Talton Cup. It is a competition worth fighting for. And I think teams are buying into it a little bit more based on what they saw last year. And there's, there still is opportunity for Fermanagh, but they will have to tighten up a few things for sure. Yeah. Well, look, you've shown...
Bonus a couple of four goals that we've seen. This is already even early on and a very good feature of this championship so far. Yeah, I suppose a lot of people will have heard lots of talk about the backdoor cut. This is a perfect example from Shane McGuigan. Now, my question is for defenders, they've seen this a lot. Shea Cullen was coming out there. There's no real danger if Shane wins that coming towards the sideline, but he's slowing down, and so the awareness that he's going to make that cut has to be there, and the defender needs to position themselves accordingly. Shane Walsh had a, had a piece where the defender should always watch, be able to see man and ball, uh, and that time Shea was seeing the ball, but allowed the space in behind for, for, for McGuigan to exploit. This, this is Ross Common, the Ross Common game. We're seeing it across a number of games, Jackie. Like, it comes for Ross Common's goal just before half time last week. We see it below in Tralee. This is actually with a kick pass, Tony Brosson into David Clifford. It's basically, it's just a change of direction, it's a change of speed. I know certainly when I was playing, I used to prefer when a defender was getting really, really tight that you could hear them or you could feel them breathing on you because you could spin really, really quick. It's something Conor Callaghan does an awful lot with Dublin as well. And it's something we're seeing an awful lot of um, in the league. And I'll see, I think we'll see a lot of goals in the championship. But I think, as we were saying today, in that defenders are going to have to smarten up to this. Yeah, you're just expecting... It's, it's, you're, you're waiting for it the whole time. You're watching the game. I said Shane Walsh, it was Kevin Walsh, actually. But he talked about it, it was like sort of out of basketball, that the defender has to be able to see both the man that he's marking on the ball and the defender always has to cover the, the most dangerous area. If Shane McGuigan in that clip we showed, if he took the ball heading out on towards the wing, that's a safe zone essentially. The back door cut, as it's known, that's the most dangerous play and teams are so savvy now, they're so used to trying to, to break down these blanket defences that they're getting very good at it and waiting for the defenders to sort of alter their position in a wee bit to try and cut that off more. Yeah, for sure. Well, look, that's definitely something for us uh, to keep an eye on over the next couple of weeks. few things that we have spotted and a few stories that have caught our eye this week, though. Two big departures from the GAA landscape as Fergal Horgan steps back from inter-county refereeing and Dublin GAA CEO John Costlow retires after 30 years of service. Despite our worst fears, naming teams on a Friday might just work as dummy teams become less apparent with only just two changes today. Leitrim GAA hit back after social media abuse of players following the New York defeat. But no doubting the big talking point in the country this week and the GAA was no different. In between dodging slitters in family and giving the epic museum ammunition for some mayo bashing, the US President Joe Biden had some classic one-liners and he also gave us the line of the week. Oh, one more thing. Mayo for Sam! Mayo for Sam! He yeah, had a few clangers as well, too, in the middle of all that. Uh, I suppose, look, a couple of the things that we did want to chat to you about. John Costello, when you look at it, 30 years of mm -hmm. service, I mean, it's, it's incredible what he has done for Dublin football over the years. Phenomenal. Like, he, obviously, we all know the story of Dublin over the past 10 years, but all of the sort of the infrastructure and so much of the good work that was behind then their, their six in a row team was, had, had his fingerprints all over it. Pat Gilroy and, and Jim Gavin, obviously, from the mm. management point of view, but it's very much him, and I suppose, as a thrown man. I'm glad to see him retired. <laughs> and, and it's the same respect. I would take him in the morning, if you know what yeah. I mean. He just had that business savvy. Yeah, top-class administrator, and I think he's pushed Dublin on. Like, you know, we gave out about finances and resources and things, but he was leading the light and top class in that field. Yeah, for sure. What about the, the social media abuse then, Colm? Because it's definitely something that has crept in. We've seen it an awful mm. lot more. The fact that Leitrim are having to come out and make statements about this is not a good thing for the game. Yeah, I think there's always been criticism in G and like when myself and Linda played, the, you, it was always there. But I think on social media, the platform that's there, everybody has a voice now. And whatever about your team not doing well or losing a match, but there's personal attacks that are coming in now and I think they have no, pl they have no place. But the issue with it is it's, it's very difficult to police. What do you do with someone who's on, who's on Twitter keying in comments about a match? I don't know why people would do it in the first place, but it's, it's, something, that's, it's, it's something that we have to keep a clo clo close eye on. Yeah, for sure. Well, look, let's hope uh, we don't have too much more of that to talk about. But we're going to have to leave it there for this week. My thanks to Colm and to Enda for their company tonight. We're going to be back next week with more football and we've got the opening round of the Hurling Championship too. We'll see you then.